Hackler world, Starlink terminals, those dishes that connect to Starlink satellites, have been hacked by a white hat hacker. Using just $25 in off-the-shelf hardware, he was able to gain root access to a terminal, allowing him to explore the wider Starlink network, a capability which could enable exploitation of Starlink satellites themselves. So Starlink terminals are pretty locked down bits of kit. There's no way to run custom code on them in the form of plugins or apps. These things run firmware signed by Starlink and that's it. This forced the Belgian security researcher behind the hack, one Lennart Wouters, hope I got that right, to be creative. After disassembling his terminal, or as SpaceX calls them, Dishy McFlatface, he opted to use a voltage fault injection attack, otherwise known as glitching, in an attempt to load modified firmware, enabling full access to the dish. This attack method, glitching, isn't new. It's the same technique that was used to hack air tags, turning them into Rick Roll tags. Glitching works by interrupting the power supply to the dish's CPU for a very short period of time in order to skip certain processor instructions. The aim here is to skip the secure boot code, which verifies that the firmware stored on the memory chip is signed by SpaceX and hasn't been tampered with. Glitching isn't straightforward. It requires a lot of trial and error. But eventually, our security researcher was able to bypass this secure boot mechanism, loading modified firmware, giving him complete root access to the dish. So whilst this level of access gives him complete control over the dish itself, it doesn't necessarily allow him to attack the satellites that the dish connects to, though that's not to say that this root access wouldn't be incredibly useful to someone wanting to attack those Starlink satellites. In the words of our researcher, as an attacker, let's say you wanted to attack the satellite itself. You could try to build your own system that allows you to talk to the satellite, but that's quite difficult. So if you want to attack the satellites, you would like to go through the user terminal as that likely makes your life easier. And attacking satellite communication is something to worry about. It's not confined to the realms of science fiction, at least not anymore. For example, in the early hours of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a cyber attack knocked out thousands of modems used to connect to KASAT, a satellite which provides internet access to much of Europe. And Starlink has been a target too, albeit of a less sophisticated attack type. Elon Musk confirms that Starlink terminals in Ukraine have fallen victim to jamming. Both this jamming and the operation against KASAT modems have been attributed to Russia. Though back to Dishy McFlatface. Our researcher wasn't satisfied with the hardware he used to pull off the hack, as it is quite fiddly and expensive, so he went one step further, ditching his pricey lab equipment and replicating the attack with a Raspberry Pi Pico, before going yet another step further and creating a custom PCB that can be directly soldered to the dish. Typically referred to as a mod chip, this PCB contains all the electronics needed to pull off the hack, and it costs less than $25 to put together. On top of that, it's all open sourced. So the researcher here did responsibly disclose the vulnerability to SpaceX last year, earning him an undisclosed sum of money through their bug bounty program. It's only now that this has all become public after the researcher gave a talk and did a live demonstration at Black Hats, an annual hacking conference in Vegas. As for fixing the problem, well, the vulnerability here is a hardware issue. SpaceX simply can't fix it with a software update. Instead, new hardware would be needed. However, SpaceX can make exploiting the vulnerability more difficult, and they have, issuing a firmware update which blows a fuse on the dish, permanently disabling serial outputs. The mod chip used this to trigger the attack. Losing serial output does make the hack harder to do, but it's not impossible. So there's a lot of details in this segment that I just didn't have time for. To be honest, this topic could have taken up a whole video, so I'll make sure to leave some links for further reading below if you want to dive deeper into this. Next up, Speaker of the US House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, recently made a trip to Taiwan. China wasn't too thrilled with the idea, claiming it violated their territorial integrity, and so, beside the military drills that China launched in response to the visit, there was also a lot of drama in cyberspace. I do realise this news is a week or so old, but it's still worth digging into, and I'm well aware that Nancy Pelosi is controversial and widely disliked for various reasons, but we're here for the cyber stuff, not the politics. Besides, the fact that this drama between China and Taiwan was caused by Nancy Pelosi's visit is largely irrelevant. Her trip made the news because it was the first visit a high-ranking US official has made to Taiwan since the 90s, so he would have got the same drama whoever the speaker was. 
As for that drama in cyberspace, during the speaker's visit, Taiwan's Ministry of Defense as well as the presidential website suffered a DDoS attack. The latter attack lasted only 20 minutes, though even after coming back online, the site just displayed the message OK for a day or two. But even before Pelosi's visit, a number of government departments as well as Taiwan's largest airports had their websites booted offline. More interesting things other than just DDoSing went down. Bad actors hacked into billboards and TV screens in Taiwanese supermarkets and railways to display some very unwelcoming messages, referring to Nancy Pelosi as an old witch. The messages didn't say anything more interesting than that, just the usual propaganda that Taiwan should reunite with China, etc. It's been suggested that the billboards had a backdoor programmed into them, given that they were running Chinese software. But it's likely that the software being Chinese was just a coincidence and the miscreants got in some other way, as Taiwan does use a lot of Chinese-made tech. Some people might jump to the conclusion that this must have all been perpetrated by the Chinese government, but that's probably not the case. Aside from the Chinese government having nothing to gain from vandalizing a few billboards and DDoSing some Taiwanese websites for 20 minutes, the much more likely perpetrators are China's subculture of patriotic hackers. Hacktivists, if you could call them that. These guys often target the systems of organizations unfriendly to China, hence the small-scale operations, which have no real-world impact other than to put smiles on the faces of those doing them when they inevitably make the news. Nevertheless, the Chinese government themselves has been known to use blunt methods of attack, like DDoSing, but when they do it, it's a little more sophisticated and much more effective. For example, a couple of years back, a forum used by Hong Kong protesters was crippled in a DDoS attack by what's come to be known as China's Great Cannon. This Great Cannon is kind of ingenious. It takes advantage of the fact that all international internet traffic destined for China has to go through Chinese government-controlled routers. When the government wants to initiate a DDoS, they start intercepting unencrypted traffic destined for Chinese websites. They then inject malicious JavaScript into the responses sent back to browsers. Malicious JavaScript, which then causes the browser to DOS a given website. Using this technique, China can very quickly build a temporary international botnet. China's Great Cannon apparently runs on the same infrastructure and shares code with the Great Firewall of China, which has led researchers to the assumption that it must be run by the Chinese government. The Great Cannon isn't used often though, perhaps because of the awful press it generates. This video was made possible by Linode, who are giving you a $100 60-day credit just for signing up. Linode is essentially your Swiss army knife for cloud computing. If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. One great feature of Linode is their app marketplace, which makes it super easy to spin up servers with pre-configured software. Use Linode's Kali Linux app to quickly spin up a fresh instance of Kali. The installer makes it easy to configure the basics, like VNC passwords, whether you want a desktop environment, and so on. Linode can run almost anything by providing all the tools a developer really needs at competitive prices. Use the link in the description now to claim your free $100. As always, thanks for watching. Make sure to like the video if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one.